Okay, with that, I want to uh, introduce Kristen Grauman, um, who is a um, professor at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, she's also, for the last uh, almost probably two years now, or a year and a half, um, been a scientist, research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Um, and so uh, uh, Kristen uh, does, uh, I, I think, inspiring research in computer vision um, with the machine learning focus, of course, focusing on recognition and search tasks. Um, before uh, joining UT Austin in 2007, she did her PhD work at MIT. I think she was overlapping with Ashish there. And so I remember she was, uh, my first exposure to Kristen actually was where um, she got interested in some of the active uh, learning and, act and, and um, active evidence gathering work that Ashish and I were doing. And, we actually saw her applying this uh, with Trevor Darrell <clears throat> in terms of uh, visual tasks. It was very exciting for us to see someone picking that up and um, taking it forward. <clears throat> anyway, continuing here, um, uh, Kristen is an IEEE fellow, IIII fellow, Sloan fellow, and recipient of the NSF Career um, uh, Award, uh, ONR. YWP Young Investigators Program, I guess it is. We say YIP. <laughs> PCAS, PAMI Young Researcher Award. Um, it was really nice to see her in 2013 be selected to give the Ichikai Computers and Thought Award, which is like the kind of leading recognition for a young computer scientist uh, in AI, more centrally. Um, she's been, has, has had many best paper awards over time, won the 2017 Helmholtz Prize for Test of Time Award. And um, I have to say that um, uh, I hate ever singling out any researcher, but I just love following uh, Kristen's really creative work and the diversity of, of, her, of her fun explorations in vision and multimodal um, uh, imprints. And it's always great catching up with her and her latest thinking. So um, um, I'll just turn the mic over to Kristen. Great. Thanks, Kristen, for being here. Okay. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks, Eric, for the intro. Great to see you all here. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of our recent work in first-person vision, or egocentric vision. And this talk is meant to give a, an array of ideas that we're exploring along this theme. And so I've kind of kept it at the, the high level in some sense for most parts, but I'm happy to go into detail through your questions or offline about um, any given part, depending on interest. Okay. So let me jump right in. So I'll set the stage in terms of the big picture that this room, people in this room probably know well, which is in computer vision, we've had tremendous success in the last 10 years, you know, five to eight years, where the right ingredients came together at the right scale, the ones you see here, to allow us to do object naming, scene naming, even activity naming in images and videos. And so this combination of big labeled crowdsourced data sets with deeper and deeper networks and GPUs let us tackle as a field um, the visual recognition task quite well. And this was most famously evidenced by this great and quick drop in error on what's known as the ImageNet benchmark challenge. This is a challenge where you're given an image, you need to say which of a thousand object categories is present. Okay, so heavily supervised methods trained at a very large scale can do this quite well, and by some measures, with an asterisk in there, as well as people can do this particular task. And this is huge. This has been allowing us as a field to look at bigger and bigger problems. Now, I want to make sure that we look at what a challenge like ImageNet or other related challenges over the years do in terms of the data. Okay, so how are these systems learned? Again, they're learned from images labeled by people so that we can learn discriminative models to find these things again in new content. Now, these benchmarks are really powerful. They've pushed the success. They also have certain properties that we don't always notice explicitly. So let's call attention to them here. Two things. One, they're what I call disembodied. So these are observations, photos from the web that were downloaded and made their way into these training sets teaching all our algorithms that are now, at that moment, outside of the physical context of a particular event. Right? So they're out of the physical context, the spatial or temporal context of when that happened. That's even true if it's a video, okay? It's just a snippet of the world then. The second thing is they're well curated. These are pictures or videos that are taken by people. And people are pretty smart about knowing where to look, what moment to take that picture, how to frame it. 
uh, that, those facets are a little bit dangerous too because they are putting in some intelligence to the task before the machine even has to enter the picture. Okay, so if you contrast this kind of world with the first person perceptual experience, I hope right away you can see there's a big contrast. Right, so here I'm showing you a first person video captured from a head mounted camera worn by a person doing some daily life activity. And you can see that in this kind of visual observation, first of all, it's not just the curated moment in space and time, it's every moment. Right? It's the relevant things, it's the irrelevant things, it just keeps going, it's an ongoing, very long stream. Furthermore, this is uh, an egocentric perception or perceptual experience that is very much linked to the intentions and goals of the person wearing the camera. Okay, we're not just seeing a crafted moment or a photo, we're seeing things that are a function of what they want to do in the world, and furthermore, they're changing the world as they do it, you know, picking up things, opening doors, etc. Finally, this is a multi-sensory experience. I'm not playing audio now. I don't have touch sensors to show you here, but we know that, of course, this egocentric world that we experience, that our robots should experience, is going to be multi-sensory, not just visual. So we're looking closely at this contrast, and in my group and other groups in the field, we're trying to look to move from this status quo of internet photo learning towards this world where we have agents, systems that can learn in the context of their own motion and action, their interaction with the environment, and also multi-sensory uh, observations. And I put the child there, just think helping us trigger that thought of, you know, we can learn outside of heavy supervision, we know we do this ourselves, where just by being in the world and experiencing in our first person way, we gain supervisory signals, such as, as I'll say in a minute, being able to anticipate how things will change when we do different things. And then this shift will also allow us to tie to applications and even be motivated by applications in augmented reality and robotics. Okay, so what I'm going to show you then are ways we're trying to move towards first-person perception, thinking about so-called embodied perception. And in particular, I'm going to focus on methods we're developing that allow systems to learn through anticipating the effects of their own actions. Okay, and there's three parts I want to share. I'm going to focus more than two-thirds of the remainder of this talk on the audiovisual part, and I'll show you two things. One, multi-sensory audiovisual learning for feature learning, so representation learning from both streams. Okay, and I'll talk about spatial audio there, and then I'll build on this to talk about navigation policies. So we want agents that move and learn in the world, they need to steer their own movement. How are they going to do it intelligently from this multimodal stream? And then the, the last final part of the talk, I'll talk a bit about interaction. So this is where we care about looking at the world not as objects to name, but objects that have the ability to afford different actions. And we, the agent, needs to be able to look at them in video and expect what those actions might be. Okay, so three parts. Let's go right now into this first. And here we get our moment of zen. Uh, to, I want you to imagine yourself in this forest. Okay, now this video showed for this human videographer how there is a very close link between what is seen and what is heard, and in particular, the spatial facets of what is heard, right? So there was a bird in the tree. They were kind of steering the camera towards the bird to try and get a closer look. And had you been listening to this audio track with headphones, in fact, this would be very rich spatial an immersive experience about feeling as if you're there and sensing the spatial location of that object. Now, why can we do this? Why do we have, as first-person agents, have spatial sensing of our sound? Well, we have two ears. Uh, so we experience binaural sound, where the position of a, a sound source in the world um, reaches our two ears differently, such that we can then learn effects like the different time delay of the signal reaching the left ear versus the right ear, or the level differences, the intensity of the sound being stronger in the nearer ear, damp, more dampened in the farther ear, or even the effects of our outer ear shape, which um, they will affect exactly how we receive these reflections of sound. So we can interpret this with our two ears. Okay, so we embodied agents do this. However, if you look at an off-the-shelf method that's, that's processing single-channel audio or monaural audio, these special, spatial effects have been collapsed. And it's flat, right? There's no spatial signal. It's just the sounds without their physical context. Great. So the 
What we'd like to be able to do is have our algorithms sensing spatial sound or even producing it. And so the task I want to present you with from our work now is the task of being able to lift from monaural single channel audio to binaural audio such that it has the right spatial properties for a human listener or if we like a robot listener. So how are we going to do this? I just said we've collapsed everything in monaural audio. Well, spatial information, while invisible here, is very visible here. And so what we're going to do is look at these simultaneous tracks, the audio and visual streams, and learn this association so that we can watch this video, hear the flat audio, and then anticipate, hallucinate, or lift to this binaural sound. So in other words, input is monaural audio and video, output is the appropriate binaural counterpart for the audio. Okay. So for, before I say a little bit more about how we do it, why do we want to infer binaural sound? So I was motivating in terms of well-embodied agents. They have spatial sensing. We want to get this. But even before that, we know that if we can achieve this for an arbitrary monaural audio signal with video, we can upgrade the audio experience for a human listener. So we could make a video immersive as if you were there experiencing the sound with your two ears. But furthermore, for our systems, I'll show you in a minute how this will help us be able to learn representations that improve tasks for audiovisual processing. For example, audio source separation, where knowing where things are in the world and then hearing the sounds accordingly allows you to disentangle which source is making which sound. All right, so back to this task then. Here's how we set it up. During training, we have video in which we know the binaural sound. Okay, so this is a requirement. It's unlabeled video. Humans haven't done anything to it, but it has a binaural sound with it. From that video, we can collapse uh, to the monaural audio and look at the spectrogram, the sound uh, frequencies over time captured by this matrix for a given video clip. Then on the bottom here, we have the visual stream. These are just... Um, just renderings to hint at the objects that might be important. It's just going to be a raw video chunk over time. And then we'll train a convolutional neural network that can take these inputs and lift to the binaural sound. So during training, I know I have a loss that says we need to be able to reproduce these from just this and this. And we can train this network to do this extraction, which will allow it to automatically clue in on the visual pieces and their spatial relative positions. Uh, to, to do the proper lifting. And then at test time, we have only the mono, and we can lift it. Okay, and keep in mind, this camera can be moving. The objects in the world can be moving. Um, what we'll be producing the binaural sound for is the optical, relative to the optical center of the camera, whatever, wherever it was. So to do this, we did want to collect data so that we could train with nice binaural sound. And so to do, to do that, we just made this rig with off-the-shelf components. So you have a 3D I.O. binaural microphone. It's two microphones in these ears. And the ear shape is not just for looks. Okay? It's, also, it's really meant to capture the sound for an average human head, capturing those effects of the outer ear as well. So their spacing is like average, at, average human head spaced. Then the eyes on top of there is a GoPro camera. And these are together. So again, wherever it moves, this is the ego or first person agent capturing the sound and the sight. And then we did our capture in a music room. So we had this music room at Facebook with a dozen instruments laying around. Volunteers came in in different combinations, play them, and now we have a set of different sound sources with a variety of spatial locations. Okay, so now I want to show you uh, and, and let you hear some results. The thing is, you got to hear this with headphones. Okay, the whole point is we're creating spatial sounds. You need those left and right waveforms to go to your left and right ears. I can't do it in this room. But I can show you what's being produced, and if it interests you, please check out the, the video results online with headphones. So what we're going to look at is an input video on top, input mono audio here, and then what we're, we're inferring for the binaural streams and the ground truth on the bottom. Okay, so let's listen to this one. <laughs> Okay, so like I said, you can see this. Like what you're wanting to see is that these are the same. You'll notice they're subtly different, left and right ears, um, because of the subtle differences in how we receive those sounds. Now, to give you a sense um, a bit more about how correct, you know, or, and to see how we evaluate how correct these are, 
Um, aside from just looking at this ground truth delta with our prediction, what we did is human subject studies where we would not show them the video, okay, so we'd hide the video, but we'd play the inferred audio. Okay, so imagine you hadn't seen that video before, but I play you the binaural sound that the system produced. Then we're going to ask you a question like, where was the drum set? Okay, so, you know, listener is just hearing it, oops, and then they need to point to where those things were. So in this example, okay, we saw that then people would point, say, over here on, for the drum and over here for the piano without yet seeing the video. And in fact, when we do this, if you hear the true binaural sound, the one we actually captured, 80% of the time people are correct, um, and then 62% of the time we're correct, and the nearest baseline is correct about 38% of the time. So you might say, well, why can't they point to it? Why is it only 80% of the time with the true binaural? Well, there's different reasons. One reason can be that we actually do experience audio specific to our own heads. And what we've learned is a, an average human head. Our heads varying in size. You really need a, what's called a head-related transfer function to precisely interpret that audio for your very head and ears. So that might explain some portion of that, that loss for the ground truth. All right, so we're doing this with instruments, as I just showed you, but also other kinds of video. And so the data set we captured up there, Fair Play, is the one. But then we have a few YouTube data sets that consist of 360 videos um, together with ambisonic audio that is converted to binaural. And these contain things like tourist video, sports, um, people talking, kind of video um, descriptions, like how to cook something in some kitchen and so on. So these are more uh, different in content. Um, and these are more precise in the binaural capture. So across those data sets, the fair play and then the three YouTube ones, I'm showing you quantitatively then how well we're doing. And these are metrics saying basically how correct are those waveforms versus the ground truth measured in two, two different ways. Ours is the one on the bottom. And you can see this is an encouraging result. The kind of baselines we looked at, things like mono-mono. What if you just copy the monoral stream twice? This is not crazy. They're not that, you know, the differences are subtle. What if you flipped the visual input? That should hurt because you're putting the objects in the wrong place with respect to where the sound should be. And it does hurt. What if you just had the audio, not the visual? And then ambisonics, this is some competing and concurrent work for doing this for ambisonics audio. OK, so these are encouraging results. Um, the other part that we've been looking at, I said, was not just to improve things for you and I to listen to, but for our systems. Yes, question. Can you show the numbers again? Sure. Uh, this is a this is a loss, so lower is better? Yeah, it's an error. That's right. It's, it, what is it? It's just the L2 error of the re reconstruction error? What is it? Yeah, right. So the, on the, the, error, the Euclidean error on the waveforms and then on the envelope of those waveforms. Yeah. Yes? I had a question on the, the human test. You yeah. said the nearest baseline did 32%. I think it was 38, yeah. Okay, so, my, so 38, it seems like almost, if you switch the channels, wouldn't you then get 62% like yours? Or like, if it's, if it's just left, right, I'm pointing oh. to the two mm -hmm. sides. I'm just wondering, do they have the channels flip somehow in the baseline? Or how does right. that end up being almost yeah. exactly 62%? Right. Well, there's different ways you can make errors. And one could be putting things, you know, you could have, if it, the, the only way to, the, flipping them is not the only way to make an error. I mean, you can imagine just any kind of, offset within even a single channel could be wrong. I mean, we're, we're, we're predicting the, the delta from between the two and then adding from one to the other. So you could be wrong in the direction, but you could also be wrong even, even the magnitude or the phase of the sounds that you're producing. In the human study or? For like the baseline algorithm. So like if the baseline algorithm predicts, it can predict any of our, the methods can predict, can be wrong, not just in swapping the ears. Yeah, but it's an interesting suggestion to, you could reinforce each baseline, make sure that if you had, somehow they're not just left to right reversed. The, vis the flipped visual baseline does this only on the, the visual input side, but not on the output side. Yeah. Do you yes. think your network could uh, take into account uh, variations because of 3D? Depth also? Uh huh. Would your network account for that? Yeah. So say depth was part of the input. Yeah. Yeah. Or, I mean, networks nowadays do predict. Uh, depth from a single image. Right. So if instrument players are at different depths in an auditorium, yes. the sounds would be different. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, um, in data I'll show you in just a moment, we'll have the depth as part of the sensing, and so we can even use that directly. But I think, you know, an empirical question would be, do you need to do the inference of depth from the RGB? 
Will it help you along the way? I bet it would, actually. Um, or here, we're just forcing it to learn directly from the, the RGB. And then certainly, when, as I said, when we have depth at the input level, this is an important thing to link to the audio. Yeah, for sure. Yes. So I just had a related question, right? So you were actually, uh, you, it's, you always used visual input, right? And uh, is it always human produced sounds? So is it, mm -hmm. is the algorithm latching onto the humans to try and infer the depth or the distance between uh, two instruments in some sense? Uh, oh, do you mean like is all the sound making happening from people? With people, yeah. Not all. Um, so the, these kind of videos, for example, this one has only a car. That's probably the major sound maker. Others do have people. So there, there is music and there's people. But then there's things like skateboards rolling by, which does have a person attached to them, maybe, or okay. cars going by. Um, so it's a mix. It's a bit of a mix, yeah. But people and instruments are dominant sound makers, I think, in this data, mm -hmm. and vehicles. So, um, so I mentioned then the kind of last thing I wanted to show you on this piece was using this for feature learning. So I'm just going to give it more of a teaser result here. So what we've done is take this mono to binaural feature that's been learned and then use this as the encoding for the video and now perform separation. So we're doing audio source separation. The right answer is to come back with a soundtrack for every sound maker. And what we can say, what we can show is that using uh, what we call this 2.5D visual sound representation, we can do a cleaner audio separation. So again, more of a teaser here. I'll show you the original video and then what we're getting for the separated sounds. Here's the original. Here's the dog separated. And the violin. OK, so you can hear that disentangling happening. It's not perfect. But you can hear how you start to separate and focus your attention on one sound or the other. And the intuition why this 2.5D helped is because doing this properly, you know, think of the visual, the visual cocktail party problem. As you steer your attention spatially, you can link that to how to steer it in the audio signal as well. And that's what this encoding can help you do. Is yes. there a limit on the number of sources? How many did you try? Right. Yeah, so the data sets we've done the audio source separation with, there's not a limit on the number of sources, but typical number in these natural videos is two to three. The ones where there's more, for example, a big band, an ensemble, um, it's harder, and the methods do worse. Yeah. Another place that's very challenging still for these methods or related methods doing separation in the literature is a multiplicity of an object. So if you have a string of people all playing violin, or even just two people playing guitar, or even, even sometimes two people speaking, then you know, the frequencies are similar of these sound makers, and they're that much harder to separate. That said, this is where the attention to the subtle motions of the different emitting sound makers can help do the separation better than if you didn't have the visual at all. Yes? So for this uh, separation, how many measurements do you have? You have maybe you have two measurements, one on the left ear, one on the right ear. Ah, the input is mono. Okay, so it's just one. Just one. Okay. Do you think that just kind of waste two measurements will make this task? Yes. There? Yeah, if we have them for sure. And I mean, you can kind of think of what we've just done is to learn that lifting to to give you that <coughs> experience of multi-channel without having measured multi-channel and. The motivation is that arbitrary video we look at won't have multi-channel, let alone binaural, full binaural sound. Yeah. But more microphones, the better, certainly, for this task. We just don't always have them or assume them. <laughs> okay. So let me now talk about navigation. And I said at the beginning, we're talking about embodied visual learning. And this includes multi-sensory. And now I'm going to show you how we can bring together this multi-sensory and spatial sound understanding with an agent that has to move its own camera. OK, and this is brand new work um, that I'm excited uh, to show you. So first, let me get a little more context. So in computer vision, um, there's increased interest lately in looking at visual navigation problems in novel unmapped environments. So this is not an environment where you've gone in and scanned it, you've done SLAM, it's all mapped. This is a new environment. You walk in, your first view from the egocentric agent is just one snapshot, and now you're going to view this over time as you move. So RGB from egocentric point of view, or RGB in depth. And then you can be given a task that's navigation-based, like, where's the telephone? Or here's a picture of a telephone. Can you find it? OK, so there's a lot of exciting work going on in this space. 
And really what's new coming from the computer vision side is to do this not purely in a geometric way. So to learn semantic priors essentially about how worlds, indoor environments are laid out such that the, at the time of encountering the new environment, it's not limited to just measuring it. It's also able to infer semantic context and expect certain things when we turn different ways. So what I'm showing you here is an egocentric point of view over time of an agent that's exploring the environment and at the same time building up a 2D occupancy map here from the egocentric, it's egocentric at every moment, about where things are and where are navigable areas. Now what's new again in this body of work that people are exploring is to do this not purely based on SLAM, but to do it in a way that we capture memories of spatial context, just like what have I seen where and what am I likely to see, say, when I turn this corner. And you can imagine how this helps an agent, if it has that context, to turn the corner when it's likely to give new info or vice versa, or to go straight to where the telephone is expected given the kind of rooms it's seeing. Okay. So this is all visual navigation and novel unmapped environments. What we've been doing most recently is to tackle this problem from a multimodal embodied perspective. So audio, in particular, audio visual navigation. Why is audio gonna help our agents navigate? Well, this is quite intuitive. So here, um, I'll give you a few examples where sound informs the navigating agent. One, if the target of your navigation is a sound emitting source. That's the one we're studying most closely. So the phone's ringing somewhere in the house, you need to go find it. How's the agent go navigate to it? But also other things like safety. So, you know, the dog's barking somewhere, uh, there's some sound, and that would indicate to an agent places that should or shouldn't be explored or navigated next. Semantics. So the agent's down here, but it hears water running up to the top right, which might suggest what kind of room could be there or could not be there. Um, and finally, materials. So sound that we receive is a function of both the physical geometry of the space as well as the materials in the space. So imagine you know, walking across the marble floor versus walking across a barely plush carpet. You hear it differently. And so having a model, even during navigation, that understands this will have an expectation about materials that are going to be encountered. OK, so let me then show you what we're doing more specifically. We're looking at that target-based audio navigation, uh, audio visual navigation problem. The agent is placed into a novel, unmapped environment. We'll only get its egocentric view, plus or minus depth. RGB plus or minus depth, and now it has to go navigate to that sound source. And here what I'm rendering on this picture is a top-down view of some 3D environment with the pressure field for the sound rendered in it. And I'm doing this so you can get a little hint of why this could be so valuable for a navigating agent. Even without giving it a pointer to where that target is, the sound itself is revealing the general direction of the target, and furthermore, sort of some intermediate goals that the agent might learn to approach. Because here's, if you can't tell, these are doorways here, these are walls. So if it goes this way, straight towards the sound, it'll slam into this wall, but if it goes to where the sound's bleeding out, it'll go very quickly to where it can actually navigate towards the sound. Yes? Is there always a single sound emitting source? In the experiments, I'll show yes, but for the environment and platform we've created, not limited to it. So you could add together some multiple sources in different places. Oh. This might be a naive, <coughs> naive question. So how is this different than, say, a setup where you have the ability to navigate visually or whatever, and simply going in the path that, where the amplitude of the sound is increasing? Yeah, this is, this is a good baseline, right? So, so we could, what, what I'm about to show you in the model, we'll learn this. But so it, in principle, can be richer than solely an intensity gradient of the sound to include things like the materials, um, major obstacles that will, you know, we need to use the both together, right? If I just follow the intensity of the sound and not, don't pay attention to visual, as the results will show, then, for example, um, I'll run into the couch and now I've got to go around it. But if I saw it together with the sound, I don't need to run right, into I it. you already use some visual capabilities yeah. and simply other use of frequency or amplitude response to guide you to that source. Yeah, so in a sense we're doing this, and this is new, but we're doing it not by hand coding, neither are we hand coding, you know, that we should pay attention to intensity, it's gonna learn this from the audio spectrograms directly. Okay. Yeah. So I'll say a little bit more about what we're doing here. So first we needed to create the platform to do this kind of navigation. So in computer vision, as some of you um, already know, we're getting a lot of mileage and interesting problems out of working in very realistic 3D environments. So before the robot, 
at least training in, in simulation. And so these are real world scanned meshes of 3D environments that so far have been purely visual. And what we're doing is starting to add the audio to them. So here we took the replica environments, which is a public repository from Facebook, um, of different 3D environments like the one you see here. This is an apartment. The apartment exists at Facebook and now it's been scanned, very high um, resolution, very realistic. And you could render a picture from any direction you wanted, putting your agent through this world in 3D. Um, and now we're adding the sound. So what that means is we have a room impulse response stationed at here a grid of locations, a grid, a discrete grid only for, for um, size regions. We're going to store the room impulse response at each of these pairings of source and receiver. So in other words, you know, given the data we've generated here, how to render the appropriate sound to meet the ears of your binaural agent when it's at a given position and the sound source is at some other given position. So if sound source were here, for example, and my agent were at any of these black dots, we can render the appropriate two spectrograms for the left and right ear for how they'll receive the sound when standing at that position and at, when standing at one of four orientations. Okay. So this we're, we've generated. In fact, we pre-computed it so now we can rent, pull these up on the fly for any given position. Yes? Accounting for materials or no? Accounting for materials. Okay. Yeah, so there's... So you take the 3D mesh, and then these meshes, like others in Matterport, have semantic segmentation saying what main objects are everywhere. And then we can map those objects to materials that are then used for the sound rendering. Yeah, so the sound rendering itself is like a ray tracing on the audio, where you're, you're bouncing around um, these rays to then collect the sound you'll receive to form these room impulse responses. And now you can convolve with an arbitrary waveform. So you can make the phone ring, you can make the dog bark, whichever waveform you want to hear, convolve with this room impulse response, you'll receive that sound. Okay, so this is kind of the first step. This hadn't been done before. We made this um, rendering possible for these replica environments. And now we tackle this um, audiovisual navigation task. So I said, we have an audio emitting goal, like the phone ringing, and I'm gonna play for you now um, a video to give you a sense of what this means for our agent. So the left will be the RGB egocentric view. That's what the agent sees. The center is a top-down map of the environment, but remember the agent doesn't have it yet. It's just placed in the new environment, hasn't pre-mapped it, but we'll see it start to map it and put, um, uh, start marking things in light gray as they become known as far as occupancy, non-occupancy for the agent. And on the right, this is just a full rendering top-down of the environment that this, this map corresponds to. Okay, so let's just listen to this. Again, you gotta do it with headphones to hear the spatial sound, but you'll at least in, uh, hear the intensity in my video. And I mean the intensity of the audio. Hopefully it's intense in other ways too, but mainly intense in the changing audio. Here we go. Okay, the phone's ringing. Agent's this arrow. It's starting to move out of that room. It's getting louder. It's starting to map. Is it that way? No. We could explore over here, but sounds coming more this way. Getting louder, be on our left side, enter the room, and this is where it is. Okay. So this is the task that the agents are solving. So how we set up their solution is through kind of a baseline now approach or architecture for a reinforcement learning agent that is going to take these multi-sensor observations and learn a policy for how to navigate. So where the action space is moving in any direction or stopping. Um, and then it'll be rewarded for uh, being able to navigate quickly to the right target. So the inputs on the left-hand side are the vision. So RGB in depth. And we try ablations of how much either of those matter. Uh, the audio, again, spectrograms for the left and right ear the binaural sound, which is received from the simulations I just mentioned, and then optionally, GPS. So in the world of visual navigation, people have been relying very heavily on GPS um, in these indoor environments. In fact, the norm is to assume it's perfect, and it always points you straight to the goal. So you enter the environment, and there's a delta x, delta y that says the goal is there. It's still not trivial to get there because you have to navigate actual obstacles, but it's a constant, dense signal to today's agents uh, to say where the goal is. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, so then these are the inputs, the observations, and then we have this reinforcement learning loop 
where here we're using a simple model, recurrent model, where we'll be sampling the actions and then moving around in the environment and then getting these new observations. And again, the reward is if we navigate efficiently to the target. Okay. So it's kind of a first approach to bring in this audio now that we have it in order to solve the audio-based navigation task. So, could, so Kristen, do you, do you find that the, or do you, do you conjecture that the reinforcement learning procedure with its, with its uh, explore is actually learning something about um, given where you are, where to move to, bet, to actually better listen so that you can better move in the future based on change in signal of the audio. Right. Implicitly. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's a very rich notion of saying to gather information, get to gather evidence, given where I am and given my current conception of structure and right. navigation path and, and location under uncertainty, where I move not to get to the, not to get closer, but right. to, to better listen. Yeah. Yeah, and there's scope for that. And, you know, first of all, the more multi-room the environment is, the more important that is. If I'm just in one in a room like this, there's going to be less of the need for it. But the more you're in an apartment, it has an upstairs and a downstairs, then you're, it's less myopic decision-making is needed. Um, this model, you know, is a first stab. And so what we're doing more, even more recently is making a map-based memory here. That'll be even richer for encoding this kind of long-term aggregation of what I've heard where, such that, like you said, you could plan to not just observe and get closer to the target, but get to the place that it'll hear better. You know, maybe the agent was, you know, standing behind the counter, and then it realizes, well, first thing I need to do is get away from this, out of beside this counter, so that I hear, you know, a more open sound. I just made up that sort of close example of the way you're talking about. Yeah. And uh, regarding the reward signal, so is it just uh, sparse for success or failure at the end, or is it's done. So you get a big reward if you, when you hit the target and say stop, and you get small rewards, positive and negative, as you're moving clo closer or further deviating from the geodesic path to the target. Okay. Yeah. And as far, a little bit of visualization about what's, what's it learning. So kind of back to your original question, you know, about can we, can we provide intensity and follow this gradient, for example. Um, it is picking these out of the, the raw spectrograms and learning them jointly with the audio. So what I'm showing you here are T-SNE plots for um, the distance to goal on the left, the angle to goal on the right, for the audio features we've learned. Okay, so spectrograms came in, but then there's some layers there that are learning to encode it. Um, and here, if we project all the way down to two dimensions, is how those lay out. And on the left on, and right, I'm color coding with respect to these two things. So in other words, you can see that these points are clustering together by color, which means that similar observations are at similar distances to the goal which is good. It means it's starting to interpret the sound that it receives as a measure of how far it is from the goal. And on the right, a little less so, but there is some signal of, of orientation that the agents picked up from its learned encoding to say um, whether the goal is, say, to my left or my right, as coded here from blue to red. So just to say that these features that are learning are picking up on the things we would expect to be necessary to navigate well. So now let me show you some navigation results. And I'm going to compare to what's called a point goal agent. So point goal is what I said earlier where the norm today that people are tackling very closely is where the agent sees, but it also always gets this dense signal about the pointer to the target. It's a Euclidean pointer, or in, you know, the, the, not the shortest path geodesically, but just a pointer to the displacement vector to the target. And here in this particular episode of navigation, what happened was the ground truth shortest path from the starting position to the goal is here in pink. The agent's path, in this case, failed for this baseline. Um, it only can see and it has the GPS. And it ended up kind of bumping into walls. You know, what's happening here is that there's this strong GPS displacement and um, pressure to move towards this guy from here. But, you know, there's a wall here. So that's the wrong way to ultimately go. You need to exit the room here. Uh, or originally here and come down to the goal. So it can be misleading um, and inefficient for the navigation. And so in this case, point goal over you know, the whole test set of doing these kind of episodes, whether using no vision, whether using RGB or depth, is getting these levels of what's called SPL, success rate normalized by path length. Okay. So now um, the key place where the audio helps, so now let's say I keep the GPS, Fine, but I also have the audio. Now, the same environment, 
we're navigating from this starting position again. Again, pink is the shortest path. And Argent took this not shortest, but rather relatively short path in the blue to get down to the goal. And it succeeded in this case. And so you can see how the audio, do you remember my pressure field sketch like a handful of slides before where there was the sound bleeding out of the doorways? This is where it's using that effect, right? It's learned that given the GPS pointer is pointing that way, fine, but there's sound indicating that first we need to exit that door, enter a new door, and come down here. And this, this is where we see the most advantage. And across the episodes, this is kind of the difference uh, that we get in terms of the navigation success rate. Yes? So how many episodes does it need to train? Oh, uh, yeah. I believe it was on the order of 100,000. I'll double check and make sure that, yeah, that's what I remember. So in that sense, uh, does it help to try something like inverse reinforcement learning or imitation learning in this? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> right. We tried it with and without. So imitation you can do by generating some shortest paths in advance and then learning to follow those. Um, and this is an, a fine thing to do for pre-training at least. In our experience, at least in the settings we're looking at here and for some exploration things, um, it was... It was similar with and without. Yeah. But just as you're, I think, getting at, you know, in the, in the absence of ample, ample experience in training, this could probably shorten the training time at least. Yeah. 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 So this was good. Now, this good. I mean, we do hope that once we add more sensing, we get better at doing the task. And this happened. You can see it in the success rates. But even more exciting, I think, is this result, where we want to know you know, can we remove this GPS altogether? For one thing, it's a sensor we can't truly rely on. And it's un perhaps unrealistic to say you enter this new environment and there's already a pointer telling you where the goal is. This isn't really so much matched to a real world task. Whereas entering a new environment saying, where's that phone ringing, I think is. And what this result shows is if we go from on the left to having perfect GPS to on the right to having more and more corrupted GPS for all the agents, ours, here shown in um, red and blue, and that baseline one, this kind of status quo, which is in green, what happens? And so that point goal agent that was so strongly relying on dense GPS starts to fail as that GPS signal is wrong. The audio goal agent, which is one I'm just introducing now, this is an agent where we don't even touch GPS. And so it's purely relying on visual and audio streams. And yet, of course, it's stable now as the GPS gets wrong because we're not looking at it. This is good. And furthermore, if you bring them together, the agent I talked about a second ago, both the audio and the GPS, it's going to degrade more gracefully because audio is a proxy in some sense for that GPS signal, right? It itself, the audio we're hearing, is a pointer to the goal. But we would argue it's a more real-world pointer to that goal. So this is exciting, saying that you know, in this setting, audio can start to supplant GPS and at least let us have agents that can navigate to audio sources without relying on perfect GPS. Okay, so in the remainder, I'm going to talk about affordance learning, where on this will round out this, our current view of learning representations and policies from first person point of, from the first person point of view. Um, I'll pause for a second because I'm about to move out of the audio. Yes, please. Can you ablate the vision too in the in that model? So, like, if I just follow the audio signal, like that, if I follow the gradient of it, then that's sufficient. So I don't need to know anything about the. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't in that chart, but we do have this tested for the blind agent, right, where yeah. you remove the uh, visual at all, and it's inferior. So the we still need the visual, and we still do better if we have it. And it's effects like the one I was mentioning, like if you have a big obstacle. You know, and but the audio, like I'm in this open room and I don't see anything, but I hear the sound over there. I go, but then I run into the couch, and so the visual still plays a role. Yeah, and it kind of goes in that order in our results, consistent with what others report. You know, depth strongest, RGB, and then um, the blind. Yeah. So if, you, so if you could move in three up and down, you could maybe also result. So I'm thinking, yeah. like, if I could, like, duck behind something, then I, yeah. would, I would hear the audio change. Yeah, yeah. And so therefore I would know that there was an obstacle there. So, I'm, I'm, so yeah. you could kind of make this even richer and then maybe remove the... 
Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, there's nothing stopping from pre-computing those or even, event, you know, as we're working on, render them on the fly. But you're right, we rendered the sound assuming an agent, like, say, a wheeled robot that's a certain height, and it's not able to duck or fly. Um, but yes, you, you just want to change that Y coordinate, and then you could receive the sound differently that way. And it would be fun to try, yeah. All right, so let me talk about interaction. And this is where I said earlier, we care about not just naming objects of a thousand types in the world, but looking at the world to say, how do I use the objects that are there? Which objects can I even use, or how would I use them? And this is the notion of object affordances, meaning the potential for action. So an agent looking at this lamp would say, it's a lamp, but also I can see that here I could toggle something. This looks adjustable. Over here I could move the base. I could replace this part. And I'm well aware that a robot replacing a light bulb sounds like a little futuristic, but we'll just go with this example for the moment because of the difficulties of the manipulation. Okay, but we want to see these objects in terms of what we could do with them. And how do you do it now? So current methods have been looking at this really in a standard supervised way where you say, okay, we've got visual inputs like this book, and I want my system to predict regions where a verb is possible. Like, where could I hold this book? And so people have trained things much in the spirit of what's known as semantic segmentation, so usually used for object labeling, but you can think of using it for verb labeling too, where people crowdsource labels to say where I could do these things, and now you train models that knew how to look at a new instance and make similar labels. Okay, like 2D segmentation. So here's the problem, though. There's the usual concern, like it's heavily supervised, that's expensive. But also there's this hop of information, right, where I'm asking annotators, if I do this approach, we're asking annotators to think about how would you hold this book and then write it down with a mouse to tell the system how to learn how to hold a book. And this is a hop that I think we can avoid. So our idea is to learn from video how people use objects. Okay, so look at all the multiple ways you can hold, use a book. Here I'm showing you from a few third-person views as well as on the bottom right from an egocentric first-person view. We want to capture these kind of interactions directly from the video without this intermediary of a person labeling images. So this is the problem we wanted, we wanted to address. So let me show you how this works. So we consider it weekly labeled data. So we have video where no one said this is where you hold or press or rotate the book, but we have video that is labeled for actions. So we have videos of people holding, videos of people opening, and so on. And those are labeled in time. So first thing we do is train an action classifier with this data. So a stream of frames comes in. This is a LSTM, a sequential model on the frames of the video that will then learn how to aggregate this info over time to predict the right labels for a new video. And number of labels, these verbs, there might be, in the data sets I'll show you, there's like 20 to 125 of these verbs that exist. Okay, so that's just action recognition. So then what the new part that we're doing here is then to think, let's train a model that knows how to look at the object at rest, the object before anyone's interacting with it, and anticipate that this action could be possible. Because that's what an affordance is. It's not saying, well, here you're opening the book. It's saying this is where you could open the book or the microwave. So what we do is introduce a module in this entire network that looks at the object at rest and can anticipate how the state of the aggregated state of this temporal model for action would look. So what's the, we learn the mapping that maps this guy to this guy, and this guy is the aggregated state of this sequential model. Okay. So that's key, kind of this anticipation module that knows how to look at things at rest and anticipate what, um, what actions are possible, could be recognized. <clears throat> now the final step then is how do you turn that into spatially localized information for the agent? And for this, we take that same network and now look back at the, um, with an activation maximization kind of approach to find the spatial regions in this photo that are most responsible for the action decision for any one of those verbs. For example, pushing back through here to say, okay, for this inactive object, these are regions that most allow my joint anticipation recognition model to anticipate the verb pullable. Or similarly, I could do the same thing for the verb pressable. And now I'll come back with a different heat map for where it looks like we could press this object. OK, and you'll have a whole stack of these maps, one map per each verb. And again, there's maybe dozens to 100 plus of these verbs in the kind of video we look at. 
And the key thing to know here is that we're learning this, again, not from people drawing maps, not from people um, even, con uh, even doing contact recognition, but from watching egocentric or third-person video. Okay, so let me show you some of the real results. Two data sets. The one on the left is consisting of YouTube videos of people demonstrating products. So they pull out the product, they talk about it, they show you how to use it, and coupled with those videos, you have product <coughs> images of the object at rest. This is an Oprah data set collected at Stanford. The one on the right is a recent large egocentric data set called Epic. Consists of 32 people doing unscripted activities in their kitchens, 30 minutes at a time-ish, um, uh, and for about 55 hours of total video. And very natural kind of everyday activity in the kitchen. So again, remember then our goal is to be able to take objects at rest. So we'll have views from either of these data sets where no one's touching the object and anticipate what kind of manipulation is possible and where. Furthermore, we test this even for unseen categories. So we want it to be the case that you could learn about openability from cabinet doors and then anticipate openability on the dishwasher door. Right? So it's a visual thing that'll translate. There's no boundaries on the objects. It's, um, the boundaries are on the verbs. All right, so first I'm gonna just show you some pictures of what it looks like. So these are frame by frame estimates by our method for the affordances that we see. And I'm showing here color coded the top five most frequent ones that happen in this epic data set. And you can see in this example, I'll go back. Um, green means mixable. So right before you start mixing, this looks like a visual region that's mixable. The person does end up mixing this one. Um, and then over here, there's another one over here that looks mixable. Okay, we're anticipating that. This one, the pink means washable. So there's some washable stuff that you're actually washing. Don't forget this guy over here, this at rest object that also looks washable. Is the person actually washing that thing on the side? Which thing on this side? The, the, the knife. This one. The, the knife, the other one. This one? Yeah. Not yet. But they should. <laughs> I mean, I mean, so, <laughs> if it is not, then there is somehow it is clear that it's going to watch that thing. Yeah, it's and it's not, predicting, <laughs> it's not predicting intention, right? It's detecting affordance. So, right, so this isn't a model to predict what you will do or this person will do, but it is predicting what this object would afford, whether you want to do it next or not. Yeah. Yes? Conditioned on the fact that there's a sink nearby. Yeah, probably, because okay. it's looking at the whole visual frame. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So if I, if I shifted, if I had a bunch of dirty plates that were just in a rack or something that's like a little bit off frame, like right. it, would, it would presumably not mark them as, as well. Yeah, so depending what was in the training data. Yeah. yeah. So like if, if it was learning about washable stuff in video where you keep stuff like that, yes, and then the more you keep it by the sink, exactly, yeah. And you'll notice it happens too that it's, it's not wanting to wash these things, even though there's stuff sitting near the sink, yeah. Now, if I, I, I have to say, you know, it's not that fine grain, it's not that perfect. If I went into this video and put a knife that was having no fragments of food on it, I mean, it might also look washable, right? So that's probably not that fine grain yet. I'll show you a couple more here. You know, this looks mixable. There's nothing to mix. Those jars looked openable. This door looks openable, um, which is cool. Like I said, we're learning about doors or their openability properties independent of the specific <coughs> category. And the last one I'll show on the left, this is saliency. So off-the-shelf sanity, you get interesting regions, but they're not coded for action. What we're giving you is the, in this method is the ability to look at the, the video from the first-person view of an agent, eventually a robot, who knows what kind of things are possible, you know, mix, could I mix this, I could open this, uh, from its first-person uh, point of view. It would be kind of interesting to think about um, how you could take a, a robotic arm, which is different than a hand, and the whole map transforms yeah. through a transfer learning procedure. Yeah. Well, starting with just the direct training and look at like a, because you know, to a robot arm, you might have a way different map of what you could do with objects. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So we know that our bodies are different than robot bodies. Um, at the same time, this is giving us um, a way to put a prior on where, you know, where in the scene or even where on the object are things possible. Um, and actually, if we hold the thought on the robot, I'll have one slide, two slides from now because we're starting to get there with a, with a simulated robot arm. Yeah. But you know, for handling that domain shift, you might think about learning explicitly the transfer between the two. Yeah. So we've evaluated what I just showed you quantitatively, where you want to know, are those heat maps the correct heat maps? 
We can do that with some ground truth that humans made. We can do that comparing to other ways you could weakly supervise using gaze or other saliency, um, as well as heavily supervised methods. And overall, this is just to say that across these two data sets, across an array of metrics looking at that heat map correctness, um, things are pretty good. They're certainly much better than the existing methods that also have weak forms of supervision and even starting to compete with those that have very heavy supervision. I don't know why. Yes. Sorry. So, I'm thinking about, uh, can I solve, the, for, for example, a washable problem in this way? I just have a segmentation model. And then when it's a uh, recognized knife, and then yeah. I predefine that knife is washable, yeah. and some other things are not washable, and then just solve it in this right, way. Right, right. Yeah, that's a lot like this map, this baseline, actually, which is heavily supervised because I think a shortcut you just suggested would be, well, I don't, I, at least if I know this mapping between object names and verbs, I could say it that way as opposed to drawing them. Um, but the drawing them version of it, that's what the image to heat map baseline is doing. Yeah. So heavy annotation. You still had to annotate the objects. Yeah, to do but, that. Uh, for kind of object uh, recognition or segmentation tasks, there's plenty of, so I can um, use them. Yeah. So I do not yeah. need to annotate this move sure. or Yeah, uh, yeah, I see what you mean. Kind of it's a shortcut as saying, like, they already annotated Coco, so, like, I'll use those labels and then try to do affordance. Yeah, it would be a variation on that one. I think the cost still exists, as in someone did annotate that data. So, in yeah. fact, this strongly supervised solution is now better than this. We can supervise the solution. For this, um, yes, for this evaluation metric of saying, are the heat maps correct against human written ground truth? And we, we have to keep in mind that I mean, we present that because it's very firm about like, how well is it doing. Um, but as I said at the beginning, there's also this hop of like, where humans say they would do stuff versus how they do it, which might be a bit more diverse than what we say with our mouse. Yeah. Question. Do you think, can we not use the object labels at all? And uh, basically, the, this replaces all the object detectors that people are using those expensive labels mm -hmm. to train for various domains. Well, I mean, there's no object detection happening here, no, but, um, but it's not going to detect objects. It'll detect affordances. So it might be a hint about object boundaries and things. Then this yes. is still relying on all the labels for the actions that yes. you have in these data sets. That's right. Ours is using those action labels. Those are the labels we use. Yeah. That's right. Could we get rid of those? Maybe. But, but the weak supervision is basically coming from the fact that you don't have the labels for the objects. You only have the labels for the actions. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Maybe the Do any of the affordances transfer actions. between data sets? <laughs> The verbs from like Oprah to yeah. Epic. And vice versa? Yeah. I don't know their overlap offhand. I think some would some would certainly overlap. Because then you, you want to test the one on the other, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. We haven't tried it. What we did try is to partition object categories to say, make sure the test set has unseen, not just instances, but categories. Um, but we haven't tested the cross data set. It's a good thing to consider. So the advantage then here is that you have many less actions that map to many more objects, potentially much less labeling. That, that's one advantage I yeah. can see. Yeah, I think so. And right, I mean, that's why, yeah, this is, these are supervised in different weak ways, which is kind of complex. But the, right, labeling, labeling these videos for temporally for verbs is still a human label, um, although potentially more, um, unambiguous than asking people to label where do you hold the spatula. Okay. And I think to, to both your questions, I think, you know, I think we could take this towards not needing those action labels, um, which would be nice so that you don't have to commit to, you know, kind of language is kind of perhaps even interfering here about what we say. We could perhaps discover these actions from the video. Yeah. Yes. I'm kind of curious. So there's what, what I, um, it seems like you're getting a strong signal because of some action happening uh, at a particular pixel location that you're then labeling afterwards. What happens when there's more interaction at a distance? Thinking like doors that open automatically when you come close to them, yeah. and you might want to label, you know, where would I walk through, right? And uh -huh. the video doesn't show the person interacting with the door, yeah. Yeah. but just the door opens as they approach. Right. Or if um, like a, a fan is blowing air. Right, and it's doing something to an object at a distance or something. Right. Would that, would this, would this, would that still work here, or, or? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't have a, a partition numbers to say, like, how is it harder or easier, but, but the method, yeah, this is okay. Now, um, as in, what you're learning from the video is what to look for, and so it's not saying you have to see the hands or the contact, yeah, so those kind of things would be okay. Um, it's not shown here, but we did have a baseline that's based on hand detection, which makes a lot of sense. It's actually non-trivial to detect the hands with ego video, and furthermore, the field of view of these cameras will affect how often you even see the hands. Um, we found when we do our own ego video collection, like eating, a lot of food never makes it into the video, because you can, you can eat like this. You don't have to like take your GoPro and look down at the food. So um, the field of view actually will limit how much you even see the body in the view. Yeah, but the opening door, yeah, it's a fun one to think about. I think the model is consistent with understanding actions like that. So I want to show you two more results, two slides, and then we'll close. Um, and they're both still with this interaction hotspots. And it'll show you a bit where we're going with it. Now that we have this tool, maybe tools like it that we can develop further. One is I'd like to see how understanding how objects work or what functions are afforded will actually help us recognize them. You and I do this. Think about yourself at your friend's kitchen. You know, they have this new looking tool in the drawer, but you're like, oh, you know, I could use this like a spatula. I think it's a spatula, right? You haven't seen that one before. It's a little bit different, but that's fine. You understand the function. It's recognizable. I'd like to translate that ability to these systems. So we've started trying this, and we have some kind of initial results where we try to encode the objects the normal way to do object recognition here on Coco objects. Uh, and we encode them with these interaction hotspots as well as their appearance. So what I'm showing you here is that if you have a refrigerator that looks like a canonical refrigerator, everything's just great. And as you move more towards these unusual views or contexts, then an off-the-shelf ResNet model trying to do object recognition will start to be unsure. Totally makes sense. The visual pattern is just not as consistent. But if we code these kinds of images both, again, both as that ResNet encoding that was learned for these tasks, as well as these verbs, and here I'm just showing two of them, like holdable, openable. So not the heat maps themselves, but the features coming from this model, we can actually start to see some improvement to recognition. So there's no greater supervision, aside from, you know, we've learned these interaction hotspots, but now we take a low shot version of this task. So as low as five training examples per class, and that's where we see the benefit of having this interaction learning from video to do now object recognition. If you go all the way to, to non-low shot, if you use all the training data, that advantage goes away. Okay, so it's most valuable right now if you just haven't seen a lot of these training instances, which makes sense. Okay, so by anticipating the object function, we can get better low shot object recognition. And finally, back to Eric's suggestion, we're starting to look at how to translate this to the robot. And we're getting there through a simulator first. So the idea is this. If we've learned about these hotspots, how to touch objects, where to touch them, how to interact with them, now an agent that's learning a policy for how to do those actions, or first here, how to just do grasping of a new object, can use that human exhibited intelligence of how to interact with objects to do it better, to learn it faster. So here we're taking a, um, this 24 degree of freedom dexterous hand simulator. We're rewarding here in the baseline nothing other than getting that thing off of the table and staying, getting close to the center of mass. So here this kind of in this instance, if you do the baseline, you know, it's, in this case, it's failing to learn, um, here, try and learn from scratch how to pick up this object, okay? And it's hard. Um, but now, if you do this training while having that hotspot kind of model, something to tell you where people would start to interact with the object, this prior helps it learn it successfully and actually learn it faster. So what you're seeing is this, for this very same object, it's learned ways to pick it up, and the thing that you're seeing, that's us testing the stability of the grasp. We're pushing that robot arm around to see if it, you know, our hypothesis is that not only will you succeed at picking it up, but you won't pick it up in some crazy way that just happened to work for a moment. You'll pick it up a way like a human would that might be more stable. Okay, so this is all totally ongoing, but we're starting to, to bring these two together. Yes? What are the control primitives you're using in this? Ah, uh, yeah. The individual joint torques or higher oh. level? Yeah, all of the joints for the hand. Yeah, and the position of the wrist, yeah. Yes? Um, and uniform center of mass, or like mass distribution inside of the objects, or it brings us with these things yeah. that have handles. Is it, is the, do you have it weighted such that the, like the pan is heavier than the handle is? Oh, 
good question. What, do, what kind of mass is in the mesh itself for the objects? We haven't altered it, so it would, you know, so I believe this would be in the simulator would be uniform. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have more to say about no, that? No, no, no. Just curious. That's clearly the easy, right thing to do for start. I was just curious. I just figured yeah, it would yeah. probably be hard if you, I'm mean, specifically thinking of the pan case. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, it makes sense that it would be easy for the agent to learn that you could pick it up from almost any lip mm -hmm. normally, um, but the handle's going to be particularly right. sort of convenient for a hand, but on the other hand, if the weight distribution is really far away, then there's going to be this kind of weird yeah. torque to right, it. Right, right. To, yeah, yeah, so. yeah, we could think of how to take these models. So these models were from um, Contact DB from Georgia Tech, um, and we're looking at the YCB objects as right, well. Okay, um, and I don't know what kind of weighting they provide in those, honestly, yet, but... They don't, they also, yeah, they're they just, the, just the meshers. There's yeah. no, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely something to think about. Mm -hmm. And in this case, when you're uh, providing the videos as well, uh, would uh, would something directly uh, doing imitation-based transfer be a relevant base mm -hmm. to think about? It would, but um, but I'd like to see this succeed without imitation being required. Like, so if we don't have humans demonstrating with gloves, you know, mm -hmm. how to do this match to this simulator, but we do have what we have now, which is ego video, kind of off the shelf, real world, in the wild. By the way, we haven't totally, this, this is preliminary. We haven't totally done this, gotten there with uh, in the wild video. I think that's a strength if we can do that, right? Um, so certainly, yeah, it makes total sense. Another avenue to approach this problem is saying, well, I've got people that can come in the lab and they can show you how to take a glove and do it. But can we learn this from scratch plus video? That's the main novelty, we hope. Do you not use yeah. synthetic data for this? Just generate a whole bunch of data synthetically? So that, sorry, I think that's the first part. Could you not? generate synthetic data as training data for this kind of task instead of having to get actual data. Synthetic meaning what? Meaning that you use graphics to generate different scenarios because you, you control that. Yeah. And then use that data in order to do any kind of planning. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I understand your question right, that is what's happening here and that um, you can control this, the robot arm, and you also get these RGB frames rendered from which to learn about the experience of trying to grasp, failing, not failing. Okay, good. I just thought you said you didn't want to have to bring people in to do all yeah. these things. Well, here, both the baseline and our method would be learning from the frames that get rendered in simulation. The part we were talking about over there is where if you actually need a human demonstrator to do it, and yet neither of these is requiring that, not, neither the baseline nor that one. Right. Yeah. And the other thing is that these robotic arms are not limited to what we can do. Like, a robot doesn't care if it's holding a metal pot that's boiling. <laughs> because yeah. if it's got materials that can withstand that, right. it has, doesn't have that constraint. Yeah, yeah. It can also have suction capabilities, right. so it doesn't need fine manipulation always. Yeah. It can simply use suction. There's it's true. Yeah, yeah. Like, this human bias from video <coughs> is only going to go to a certain point. And it's totally, yeah. totally agreed. Um, both for embodiment and sensing capability, safety, all of these things. But what it will do, we think, is allow to un look at the object, probably especially in terms of its shape, and know where to approach it. Yeah. So in this particular case, just to understand, the input to the system is an image and your hotspots, and that's it? Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm kind of giving you the preview of where we're at currently. Not all these wires are connected. So in this case, we're taking, um, you know, baseline uses center mass. Over here, we're using, um, we're actually using human data about from, from the Georgia Tech data about where the contact would happen. But the idea is to then, this point that we're targeting over here will be the hotspots learned from the video. Yeah. Right, I think a concern, like what we'll have to overcome to get that is that take those epic videos which are so cluttered and you know, real world to a clean visual like this. Um, it's not, imp it's, it's to be determined how bad that is, right? How big of the hot. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, then also Kristen will be at the front of the room to answer your one-on-one. -on -one. So, so thank you very much. Yeah.